headquartered in Chicago, and we've been helping companies manage uh, fixed assets um, for over 30 years. Um, I've got a background in operations and finance prior to um, fixed asset management, and I've done a lot of work with um, helping all sorts of companies, uh, organizations, non-for-profits, and so forth, um, implement uh, fixed assets. Uh, we were also the first uh, fixed assets uh, business partner um, back uh, 15, 20 years ago, so we've been working with the product for a long time. And uh, we specialize in um, implementation, data conversions, um, also integrating inventory services, performing fixed asset inventory services, and helping companies develop uh, best practices on managing fixed assets. So just a little background on myself. Um, so let's get on to the topic here. Um, fixed assets, um, a lot of typical headaches, uh, wasting time inserting data into spreadsheets. Uh, typically, if you're managing the spreadsheet and responsible for it, you're, you're the primary um, person in charge. Essentially, it's a challenge to get others involved um, when you've got to manage a, a single document. Uh, trouble keeping track of the assets, you know, where they're located, what the updates have been. Um, you can't really get others involved. Uh, security risks associated with fixed assets. Um, or someone's made changes to the spreadsheet if you're having somebody work on it and you're not really sure uh, what the updates are. So um, it, it's a challenge uh, managing fixed assets and spreadsheets. So just want to kind of talk about some of the things that we explore and um, try to imagine life after spreadsheets. It should be better. Um, part of the challenge, I think, really managing fixed assets in spreadsheets is that um, unlike an application, and whether it's fixed assets or, you know, even an inventory or, or some other accounting uh, function, um, you know, the spreadsheet itself um, typically is the report. So however it's laid out, um, that's what you're able to report on, or you have to have multiple views and links to that. Um, the data itself um, and the formulas that are embedded um, are typically designed on the fly as your, you know, fixed asset ledger grows, um, so does your spreadsheet or your reporting requirements grow. So does, um, you know, the need to change uh, the formulas or come up with different layouts and versions. Um, and, and over time, it just gets to be a challenge to update all those changes and to keep, you know, the spreadsheet intact. Uh, you're typically updating your roll forward activity. Some organizations report fixed assets on a monthly or period by period basis. Others uh, do it quarterly. Um, so it's just a never ending treadmill of uh, updating activity. Uh, ads are typically easy to get. Um, you know, you're you're getting that information from accounts payable, but you don't always get uh, information regarding transfers or disposals. You know, there's other other departments that are involved in doing that, and um, that typically is not does not flow through you know AP or an accounting function. So, uh, getting that feedback from many sources is is what's needed to update the activity. So some of the pitfalls of poor fixed asset practices. Uh, closings, you know, it, it's a challenge to get everything done and up to date. You know, when, is the, when have you finalized everything? What are you gonna carry forward to the next uh, period? Um, you know, how that's gonna work. Uh, the accuracy of the financial reports themselves, you know, are if there were errors or some changes that were discovered, you know, that, that's going to affect your reports. You might even need to restate reports if, you know, if a material uh, change is discovered or material error is discovered. Um, and from an audit standpoint compared to a system, auditing a spreadsheet is just a lot more complicated uh, with the formulas and everything else. So ultimately, this could negatively impact your bottom line. 
And in general, it just creates a lot of busy work to manage and update that spreadsheet. Um, so those are some of the challenges that you've got to deal with. So to get beyond this, um, let's establish some higher standards. Um, your accuracy and depreciation reporting, the formulas uh, that need to be done, the variations in, in different methods and so forth you want to consider. Uh, you want to adopt some best practices and, and processes beyond just, you know, what you're doing in your spreadsheet. And, you know, if you do rely on a fixed asset application, uh, you can leave the programming to experts. You know, a, a specific fixed asset system would be designed uh, to include some of the rules and regulations that um, need to be followed for fixed assets, might even catch, uh, you know, particular errors or variations in your data. Um, so that's, that's another benefit. Um, Certainly, uh, the ability to, for file corruption is less vulnerable if it's in an integrated system um, as opposed to a spreadsheet where you could accidentally, uh, you know, affect formulas or um, even the file itself could get corrupted if you're saving it or something and you have a crash. Um, so that's another concern that uh, you want to focus on. And certainly, the enhanced security, that. That goes without saying, um, getting outside of spreadsheets. So overall, by setting some new standards, you're going to pay off in your um, savings and efficiency of the product and your overall monthly process. So who cares about fixed assets? You know, what's in it for you? Um, a lot of people either affect the fixed asset ledger and have input to it or um, re rely on the reports and the outputs of the fixed asset manager. Um, so it's not, although you know you may be the main person if you're responsible for fixed assets that's dealing with it. Um, you know, there's a lot of other folks at stake, a lot of people with their uh, fingers in the uh, in the application or in the spreadsheet. So some things to gain uh, if you get out of spreadsheets. Certainly, it'll be easier. Uh, to manage the activity. Um, if you have to fill in any tax forms or calculate some uh, more complicated uh, figures such as forecasting for capital budgets, uh, doing some future capital planning or updating a project uh, tracking sheet, you know, it's going to be easier if you've got an integrated system as opposed to having to program links into your, you know, your spreadsheet or your workbook. Um, complying with uh, GASB 34, 35 standards for non-for-profit. Um, there's some specific reports and standards that need to be maintained. One of the biggest uh, benefits, I think, of uh, getting out of spreadsheets and having some type of an integrated fixed asset system is that you can integrate with other departments. So you can have other folks involved in the process and um, if you do decide to take it beyond the book and get out to the floor of what's in the physical uh, facilities that where your assets are located, um, you can integrate uh, an inventory and tracking system. So those are some of the enhancements that you would be able to realize if you were in a system versus a spreadsheet. So let's talk about the, the signs or the warning signs of uh, it's time to move on. Um, trouble tracking your asset inventory. Um, as we've talked, the spreadsheets really don't allow you to dynamically integrate with other systems. Um, within your fixed asset ledger, if you think about it, most companies have, you know, a facility, a building, a class, you know, computer equipment, furniture, IT uh, equipment, and all of those uh, assets are typically managed by other departments. Um, in a lot of cases, there's other systems that those departments are running. If it's facilities, they might have a uh, uh, space planning application that they're using to track all the furniture and, and the resets um, as you are reconfiguring your offices um, or, or plant. Um, same thing with IT and computer equipment. 
Uh, you've got your networking infrastructure. You've got personal computers. They're getting harder to track nowadays just because um, a lot of companies are expensing computer equipment because it's the personal computer is getting down below that threshold. But you still need to keep track of it for insurance purposes and for management. So if you've got the ability to integrate your fixed asset system or database with some of these other applications that the other departments are already using, that's going to make it easier to, to get updates. So you're not having to reconcile that information uh, yourself to those various lists. Um, so typical discrepancies. If we do do an inventory um, of fixed assets and we reconcile that list of what we found in a facility back with uh, the actual ledger, it's typical that we would find anywhere from 15 to 30 percent unrecorded retirements, or we call those ghost assets. So they're asset entries on the books or asset cost basis that's on the books. Um, and the assets themselves are no longer there. So in the case of, say, purchasing, uh, you know, an entry for 20 laptop computers or, or five servers and, and related software and infrastructure as a typical invoice, a lot of times we'll see that entered into the ledger as a group entry. And as a fixed asset manager, if you find out that, you know, four or five laptops were disposed of or one server was uh, decommissioned, how do you find that on the ledger to write that off? You may not be able to, or if you have an idea of what entry it should be part of, what percentage of that entry needs written off? So from a, a fixed asset a cost accountant standpoint, you've got a big challenge if you don't have an inventory that's reconciled. And we refer to those as ghost assets. So by writing those assets and that cost basis off, you can um, take any remaining net book value and uh, that that's going to be written off. And you may realize that from a uh, not only a tax savings opportunity, but for um, insurance as well. So one of the benefits of having a, an integrated inventory system. How do you organize your assets? Well, class is a typical way. Um, asset class, as I've mentioned before, you know, furniture, fixtures, computer equipment, software, building, leasehold improvements um, are some examples. And so you typically want to organize in, in that fashion. And a lot of times those same asset classes relate back to general ledger accounts for your assets. Um, in a spreadsheet, you know, you say, well, how, how are we going to sort that? Well, you could use an auto filter if you had a class column that you could filter by, um, maybe even generate a pivot table to produce some reports. But what we find is um, beyond a single sort level, um, if you have multiple levels such as by uh, locations, if you've got offices in, in various states or cities, um, and then within those you might have different buildings, or, or departments, um, and then you then within those groups you've got the actual class. Once you start having to track and report fixed assets on a multi-level sort like that, I think it's very challenging to do from a spreadsheet standpoint. Um, in in a fixed asset system, you can save and define group queries um, or filters that can be reused as the data gets updated. Um, within a spreadsheet, uh, your spreadsheet, if you're going to add assets in a particular class, typically your subtotal formulas and so forth need to be laid out in the same fashion as your report. So that further complicates uh, reporting and gives you, as a fixed asset manager, uh, or as the owner of that spreadsheet, you know, even more challenges to make sure that you've got everything correct. 
So let's go on to the second sign. You can't communicate updates easily. Um, it's very hard to collaborate on a spreadsheet as opposed to a multi-user system. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of folks typically involved in fixed assets, information that you need to know with regards to disposals, new additions, project costs, and uh, you need to be able to get those folks involved. And if they've got a lot of involvement, they may actually need to work on your spreadsheet for you or update that. So you're at the end of your, your close, you're trying to get in and finish it up, and thus you go to find out that the spreadsheet's locked and someone else is using it. Um, so getting those kind of updates, uh, you're typically having to make phone calls, send an email, um, you know, it, it, or move around, uh, shift around a spreadsheet, especially if they're in al alternate locations, um, to get your updates. So uh, inherently having, you know, one document that's limited to, you know, one person uh, to edit or even group edits um, gets to be a challenge. Within that spreadsheet, because of that activity, there's really no audit trail. Um, there's no log in the background of who made what changes. Um, if you're reviewing uh, a, a new version of the spreadsheet, how do you verify what's been updated and if it's finished or not? Has everyone done their part? Uh, you've got multiple employees typically working on it, and you may have multiple versions of the spreadsheet or various tabs or sections that you need to pull together in some type of consolidated workbook. And, you know, at the end of the day, are you confident, that there are the, I should say at the end of the period, are you confident that you've got everything up to date, everyone's done their part for you to get that done? Which gets to the next point, overlooking errors in your spreadsheets. You know, there's a statistic um, that was done, I think, by Accounting Today. 88% uh, percent of all spreadsheets contain formula errors. Um, we've looked at hundreds of spreadsheets over the years, and there's inevitably, you know, some issue with an error, um, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, an incorrect range, uh, you know, a, a formula that, that isn't referencing uh, the proper cells or got copied or filled down and didn't, didn't get uh, corrected. So the errors can easily go unnoticed because when you just look at the spreadsheet, they don't jump out at you. Um, you know, Excel does have some audit features that do a few, um, you know, things to check if you've got some are areas where, you know, formulas aren't consistent but it's, it's, it's a process that you have to go through. It's not built into the background. Um, you know, or worse, we'll find that the trial balances don't balance. You know, what, what, what happened from last period to this period? You know, everything was in sync or everything was in sync last week. You're sitting here on the last day of close and you pull up the spreadsheet and now it's not tying out and you're trying to figure out why. Um, you, you might identify some changes but you don't know if those changes were done intentionally as a last minute update or if it's actually an error. So it gets very, um, very difficult to update that. Um, to make it even further a challenge, you know, fixed asset management isn't as simple as just, um, you know, totaling up sales figures, you know, by region. There, there's a lot of complicated depreciation formulas that typically need to be programmed. One of the challenges is when to start depreciation, you know, depending on when an asset was acquired, when it was actually placed in service, and what method you're using. Uh, there's various conventions out there, there such as mid-month or full month. You know, um, a full month takes the depreciation start in the month that the asset was placed in service, but a mid-month convention uh, would typically start depreciation the following month if an asset was placed in service towards the end of the month. And then how are you going to compute what your per period depreciation expense is? You know, we've run into some folks that are trying to do it by the day. Um, or by a percentage of the month. Um, so 
all of this needs to be programmed into a formula based on the cost basis. And the logic to manage all of this, when to start it, how to compute it, how, how many, how many um, years, you know, we need to calculate depreciation for to get back to the amount per period. It can be get, I've seen some pretty complex spreadsheet uh, logic, especially if the person that set it up is trying to use date logic to read the date fields to convert that into a per period field. And if you think that wasn't hard enough, to try to count, or excuse me, to try to program tax depreciation methods, that's almost impossible. Um, it's the maker's uh, declining balance method have a variety of percentages based on the year and the age of the asset. You might have an alternate depreciation system calculation you need to do. Um, and to further complicate it, uh, you know, about uh, several years ago, after 9-11, um, uh, uh, the bonus depreciation was put in place, or our Section 168K allowance uh, method that allows you to take a percentage of uh, personal property asset cost basis as a write-off up front and expense that, um, which then changes your bonus or your cost basis for the remaining asset. So all of these further land in what we call variation in rules uh, or treatment of the assets. You know, can they be done or not? And what we found with some customers is that they just say it's too much to take on in a spreadsheet, we can't do it. So um, we're gonna, even though we have these capabilities and Congress has offered, uh, these tax write-offs for us or these tax incentives, we're just unable to, ca uh, to take advantage of that because we can't build uh, a complex spreadsheet to do that. Sign number four, uh, your data is at risk. Um, from a spreadsheet standpoint, um, there's definitely more of a lack of security. Um, it's a single document. Are we okay from a sound standpoint? I heard a little echo. I think somebody might be off of mute. I'm trying to go through mute, but if you're... Okay, I think we're good. Okay, all right, no problem. Um, yeah, so from a spreadsheet standpoint, you've got a single document, you know, or maybe a couple documents that, main, uh, that maintain all of your fixed asset subledger. Um, if that has to be emailed to someone for review or for input, um, now you've got your entire fixed asset ledger, you know, floating around uh, as an email attachment. Um, it could accidentally be sent, you know, in a reply all or a forward to a group inadvertently um, so other people that shouldn't have the fixed asset ledger may have it. And once they've got it, now you've got copies of your ledger floating around, uh, you know, on other computers. And users could easily make changes to spreadsheets compared to a system where, you know, you have to have certain rights and access and, you know, the system itself, you may not be able to even view the uh, application unless you have it installed, the fixed asset system installed on your, on your uh, desktop and the ability to access that. Uh, the database system is typically a lot more secure in that fashion. Uh, you can set up security, users need to have rights to the application, and then once they get in the application, they need to have rights to access the system. So you've got a lot um, more uh, options compared to a spreadsheet in terms of uh, capabilities and the means to secure that. So sign number five, um, it feels like a full-time job. You know, you you get a little reprieve at the beginning of the period, um, 
you know, the month before uh, you have to uh, start thinking about fixed assets again. Uh, typically, you're in manually inputting updates. Uh, I know some customers have a process where they're getting a dump from accounts payable and they're identifying assets that are in the uh, capital asset account uh, or records in a capital asset account and matching those up uh, to then do some kind of an import or a paste into their system. Uh, once you've got that done, you certainly need to, as we've talked, update your formulas. And uh, if there's other folks involved in the fixed assets, uh, maybe it's from uh, IT if you're an intensive uh, uh, company that has a lot of, um, you know, computers and, and uh, new networking equipment being deployed, um, that, that could be a challenge. Or you might be in, a, in an opportunity like, a, let's say, a college or, or uh, you know, or building new facilities where you've got uh, you know, other types of construction projects or, or new renovations going on and you need to capture all that information. So ultimately, again, you've got to get feedback from a variety of departments on the status of the assets being deployed. And that typically would involve receiving reports from them or maybe copies of their spreadsheet that they're using to manage their system, and so you're trying to make sense of that to determine what needs to be brought into uh, the spreadsheet. So you've got separate listings, make sure you've covered everything, and it's just, uh, it gets to be a real challenge. Uh, if your company is intense uh, in terms of mobile fixed assets or movable fixed assets, having the ability to have some type of barcode reader uh, to do inventories or have an inventory system to update the status of the assets where they're, where they're located um, or, or if they've been disposed of. Uh, you don't really have that type of uh, interface within a spreadsheet. So it's a real challenge. Um, I was actually at a tax conference uh, last week, and you know, one of the focuses that they mentioned on um, was the concept of, of big data and having uh, centralized information so that uh, you can easily access the data and spend more time on analysis and less time on gathering, finding, and entering the data, uh, which I thought was a really interesting uh, concept. And that would be the same thing with a fixed asset system. The parallels there are that, you know, if, if new asset acquisitions and updates are being able to be performed um, by the various departments and people that need to work on it, they're able to do that in the spreadsheet so that when you're doing your, or excuse me, in, in a fixed asset system, so that when you're doing your, your closing, you're, you're, you can spend more time on analyzing, you know, how does this compare to last month? How does this compare to what our trend has been? Uh, you know, what updates need to be made in, ca in case you're adding, um, you know, new locations or, and so forth. Um, so spending more time on analyzing the data and rerunning reports and reviewing the reports is a lot more productive than having to go in and tweak your formulas and, and try to capture, uh, make sure you've captured all the, all the roll forward activity. So to recap, um, I think our five signs here of uh, issues, the time that we need to uh, move on, be out of our spreadsheets, trouble keeping track. Uh, we can't really get a lot of collaboration across the other department. And certainly uh, overlooking errors, um, you know, I'm sure you found a few in your spreadsheet and hopefully it was before, um, you know, you produced your final reports. Um, security, that one I think goes without saying, there's just too much risk. Uh, not only with the, the application itself, uh, but if, if your spreadsheet gets corrupt, you know, and you have to go back and redo something, um, it's just it's very risky having uh, all your assets, 
you know, your company's uh, back backbone, really, and all the equipment that they own in, in one spreadsheet. So there's just too much busy work. It's a full-time job for you. So what are some improvements? Um, well, certainly if you move on to a fixed asset system, you know, right away some of the bad practices and the manual options you had in a spreadsheet um, are going to disappear. You know, there'll be some new processes and reports that you'll have to define, but a lot of that programming, if you've got a decent fixed asset system, has already been done and set up. Um, you're spending millions on capital assets in a lot of cases, and um, it makes sense to spend spend some money on managing and, and reporting on those assets. And you certainly don't want to increase costs by poor asset management, whether it's through uh, resources or um, by uncovering errors, having to do restatements, not being able to take advantage of some of the uh, benefits or tax breaks, you know, or insurance um, premium updates that you might be able to see if you've got a better handle on uh, the fixed assets. And certainly you can accurately report and take advantage of all the benefits. Uh, the reports themselves and the visibility that you have in your fixed asset system overall is just going to improve your ROI. We talked about time and resources, uh, maximizing those tax depreciation expenses. Um, specifically, I would say the Section 168K allowance, which is our bonus depreciation, that has really come into play over the last decade, has been a major um, opportunity for a lot of companies to take advantage of uh, with the variations in write-off for tax, whether it be, uh, you know, a 30, a 50, or 100% um, deduction um, from a depreciation standpoint for tax federal tax. Also your Section 179 deduction, uh, that's something to take advantage of from a tax standpoint. And if you've got the ability to do that in, in a system that's designed to manage it, it's, it's a lot easier. Uh, the other thing that I, I think you'll find is that if you've got a system in place to track your fixed assets and employees know you are able to track that and you're keeping an eye on it and your inventory is up to date, uh, theft in general, um, the, the propensity for that is definitely gets reduced. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, uh, your ability to write off ghost assets to find out about them really plays into it. Uh, you know, we had one customer that, you know, they were doing a fairly good job, I guess, managing their assets from a spreadsheet standpoint. They even had installed their depreciation system and got that up and running, but they really never had an integrated inventory process. Um, it was a, uh, an actual a TV station. And one of the things that the fixed asset manager told me is after we got the tracking system installed, and they were able to start tracking fixed assets with a, a tag number and entering them individually to match what they had in the inventory out in the studios and so forth. Um, she said that uh, notes would just appear either in her inbox or in her email, and, and someone would say, you know, hey, Polly, I got rid of this. Uh, you know, particular camera, this item, and it had this number on it or this tag number on it, and it was easy for the the field team to communicate with the fixed asset manager because there now there was a unique way to identify that piece of equipment. And she said, you know, people were trying to help her out, and they just started to be able to provide that information. Um, and the IT group was able to use uh, the tracking in product for inventory, and so it was easier to update and keep track of the disposals. And I think in general that's something that we see when we look at a fixed asset ledger um, over several years is that uh, the amount of disposals compared to the additions, um, we just don't see a lot of visibility there, 
and uh, the disposals are minimal. It's just harder to come by. So having uh, some type of an integrated system, I think, is really going to help uh, get that information into cost accounting or into fixed assets better. So in general, I think the goal to get out of spreadsheet and just bring your business back to life is get from your manual system to an automated process. Um, you're going to get some processes in place that are different now uh, that you have a fixed asset system as opposed to a spreadsheet and it'll give you the ability to uh, eliminate that old scrap or ghost assets that, you know, have been maintained in your spreadsheet ledger uh, over a period of time. And I think beyond this, um, we'll definitely have some uh, better insights uh, in the next two series here uh, that are coming up this, this week on the fixed asset system and, and how that can enhance and eliminate some of the uh, problems that we've talked about today. All right, Julie, are there any, I think it's time we could open up for questions. I don't know if we have some questions from the, the group. Sure, um, thanks Scott. Um, before we get to the questions, I just have a couple quick housekeeping things to mention first. Um, when you exit the webinar, a small pop-up survey will, uh, a survey will pop up. If you could please just take a quick moment and complete the survey just so we can understand um, how well the survey um, fit your needs, we would appreciate it. And it'll also help us to make sure that we're bringing you webinars um, that you're interested in in the future. Um, we also have two more webinars, like Scott had mentioned, in this series coming up on Wednesday and Thursday. If you're not yet registered and would like to, please visit sagefixedassets.com to register. And with that out of the way, we can go ahead and get started with some questions. If anybody has any questions, you can enter them in either the chat box or the Q&A section, and I will get those to Scott. Um, but we have a couple to get started with. Can you provide some specific examples of errors you have discovered in customer spreadsheets? Um, sure. Uh, so a couple um, errors that we typically might find would be uh, I think the, the the biggest challenge is variation in um, establishing correct starting dates uh, for placed in service. Um, I think I had a slide on that earlier. So depending on when an asset was purchased, when it was invoiced, when it was actually deployed or received, and then it, when it was uh, set up and, and put in use, those are all variations in dates, and so establishing the correct starting date um, I think is a challenge. We'll see errors in either a formula or maybe just inconsistently applying when um, a customer starts their depreciation calculations uh, compared to one of those dates. Uh, on some spreadsheets, we might just see an acquisition date. Other spreadsheets, we would see an acquisition date and a placed-in-service date. And when we're trying to set up a conversion to establish that when that depreciation start date is and look at the total accumulation, uh, accumulated depreciation on an asset, it doesn't necessarily tie into the amount of life or the remaining life that's been used. So I think that's that's one of the issues, and in particular, um, we'll see that uh, mix up in, say, a full or a half month uh, depreciation being taken. Um, one other one that I think comes to mind is uh, variances in the uh, total number of years. So, you know, we've got you know somebody been adding their assets, you know, that were placed in service at the end of the end of the month. And uh, they've copied the formula down for the depreciation expense calculation from, you know, the assets above. And if there was a switch in life, let's say from a five-year to a seven-year or a five to a ten-year, um, they may have calculated the five-year life formula all the way down and forgot to go in and change uh, that divisor um, as needed. And so we'll see... Um, essentially just the wrong formula applied to a particular asset. Um, I think another example, anybody have another question? Otherwise, I mean, I could go through a variety of 
examples? Somebody um, pop sure. up with one? I do have one, okay. yep. Um, right. It's from John. How would you approach a conversation with a prospect that hasn't felt the pain points associated um, with using spreadsheets to manage fixed assets and finds it difficult to justify the investment? Um, that's a good one. Uh, as a matter of fact, that was my task uh, in writing this presentation <laughs> was to outline, uh, you know, what the challenges are. I think the main thing would be to establish with that prospect what the um, what their current process is. Um, I typically would ask what, you know, what do they what do they do for the calculating depreciation currently? Um, how many folks are involved and you know what is what is the um, what is the process and the time that they go through? How many people are involved? Um, you can do some quick calculations based on uh, the number of hours and an average salary for what what uh, folks are currently involved in managing fixed assets. Another air, uh, way to um, approach that might be to ask them: Have they uncovered errors in the past? Um, did they have to restate uh, any reports? Was there any penalties, uh, or, you know, around that? Um, those are some things that would definitely bring uh, bring the monetary side of it to the forefront. Um, and I think the other big one that really would play into it is um, ask them have they ever done a fixed asset inventory. And if they have, how did they update their spreadsheet, and did they achieve all the all the write-offs? That 15 to 30 percent unrecorded retirements uh, that we typically find is 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 a real figure. Just having done inventories, you know, over the last couple decades of what we come up with, and identifying and writing off assets that no longer exist, having a fixed asset system where you can get better visibility and allow collaboration from other teams, you're typically going to flush out a lot more disposals, and that's going to um, improve the cleanup. So that's another uh, good and quick way to identify an ROI. Great. Um, we have another one. What's the best time uh, to migrate to a new system, especially if you're consistently getting new assets or just Closing assets, do you need to wait until you close a year end? Sure. Um, I think from from that standpoint, in terms of timing, you know, getting pushed back on that or, or kind of, I look at fixed assets as um, it's not, it doesn't always fall into the mission critical line um, of business that you would see, say, for payroll or you know other types of uh, report accounting reporting where it's very time sensitive so you know customers may consider doing this but then they're like well we don't know if we want to get started or not um, and I think the short answer there is that um, really any time is good um, you typically want to establish a closed period um, that you're going to do that so maybe it's the uh, end at a quarter end typically, um, and once you've established that cutoff point, uh, you've got trial balances and final balances that you can work from. You can get your fixed asset data sets um, associated at that point. And then the actual conversion process um, doesn't need to take uh, a whole lot of time. Um, you know, it can typically be done in a period or so depending on the complexity of the fixed assets. And you're able to essentially book a estimated depreciation expense amount for a period if needed to, to bring your new system online. Um, some folks uh, run in parallel maybe one or two months and then, you know, tie out again at a, uh, the next close period. So um, I don't think uh, you don't need to wait until a, a year end, for example, to do that. Um, and even from a book and tax standpoint, uh, book and tax are loaded independently. Uh, the asset records are loaded the same, but you don't have to have the same uh, tie-out periods for that as well. So waiting till you close your tax year isn't necessarily uh, play into when you close your gap. 
Great. Well, it doesn't look like we've had any other questions coming in. Okay. Um, just a reminder, um, if you'd like to register for the upcoming sessions, to visit us online at sagefixedassets.com. And, Scott, I don't know if you have anything else you want to share before we go. Um, no, I think that's good. Thanks, everybody, for attending. And um, definitely consider, uh, if you are still in spreadsheets, um, I would say in general you're not alone. I've seen some pretty big uh, organizations, uh, Fortune 500 organizations, that are still, believe it or not, in spreadsheets. So um, it's definitely a good opportunity to uh, consider moving forward into a fixed asset system. Um, I think your other thing to consider is also integrating your book and your tax. Um, we have some uh, organizations that are focused on, uh, you know, maybe GAAP only, or, or they're mandated to keep their GAAP uh, depreciation in their uh, ERP system or their main GL system. But for tax, uh, they're being forced into spreadsheets because uh, that accounting system really wasn't designed to deal with all the, the intricacies and details of the tax depreciation. So um, that is another alternative. Uh, you can set up a fixed asset system and um, use it just for your tax depreciation and reporting, um, and you're just pr bringing roll forward activity in from your accounting application. And by the way, that's a common process, um, even if you're not doing it in-house. Uh, we have a lot of customers where they're just doing their fixed asset internal gap uh, reporting in-house and their tax accountant, um, you know, whether it's one of the big four or, or another uh, accountant, um, they are doing the tax depreciation and they're receiving that roll forward information from uh, the customer. So it is common to have tax in a separate application or separate from your general ledger um, in a system that's designed to manage that. Yes, so. and with that too, um, just if you wanted, the, front, the session that we're doing on Thursday will actually be looking more into the system, um, fixed asset system that we have. So you'll be able to kind of see how it works um, and get lots of questions answered too on what that's like. That's correct. Good yep. point. All right. Well, I guess if that's all, we really appreciate everybody attending and staying on with us. Um, we will be following back up with you um, in a couple of days with a recording of the session. But if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us in the meantime. We would love to hear from you. And hopefully we'll see you online again tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.